And I was like a walking zombie by the end of that month. And yeah. he gives you a million dollars. Yeah. There's no revenue. Do you understand how insane that sounds to me? You've also worked with the founders of YouTube, Android, Netflix, FanDuel. How the hell do you learn all this? That are walking in with an iced out AP and a Gucci bag. That's just a red flag. Even here in Scottsdale, somebody's gonna listen and be like, I know who you're talking yeah. about. 21 years old, Ryan Pace. He started in Volio, the app. Has anybody gone on the platform and absolutely just like yeah. shit the bed? Yeah. 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 Yep. And uh, <laughs> the ones posting the Lambos, posting, I'm making a million a month trading, pay for and they my couldn't, course. And they, they couldn't they, send a winning trade to make they, their life depend nope, on it. No, nope. Who do you got, Jake Paul or Nate Diaz? Oh, it's got to be Jake. You, Vegas is giving him crazy odds. Wait, there was like a crazy, like, fight. <laughs> <laughs> they know how to sell a fight that's for sure what is that this weekend yeah he loves that dude he'll spend his last dollar to watch a jake paul flight <laughs> fight he will go into debt for jake paul uh, yeah vegas is i think if you bet a uh, 100 on jake you win like 20 25 oh that's shit yeah they, they have him as a huge favorite just the way that Nate Diaz walks. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't look like a boxer. No. He looks old, too. Yeah. Well, welcome to the pod again. Thank you. We got Jason running around here, start of the pod. We always just start it. It's, um, it's interesting. We don't take notes, usually, on podcasts. And today I have notes, so for the camera's sake... If I'm looking down, I'm not texting, I promise. I've got a whole boatload of notes. The reason I've got a boatload of notes is I want to talk today about venture capital mm -hmm. and um, how you kind of got into that because you're 21 years old. Most people 21 years old, if they start a business, they get a loan from mom and dad or they go and grind on the bootstrap weekends it. and yeah. bootstrap their way. That's how I've always been. Every single thing I've started has been with my own capital. Yep. So kind of interesting to talk about today to how to – what could I have done differently? I'm 27 now. Could I have been somewhere further than I am today if I had gotten VC funded on different things we had built? I guess that's a question that I'm going to try to answer myself after listening to your answers. So mm -hmm. first of all, welcome to the pod, guys. If you don't know this guy, his name's Ryan, 21 years old, Ryan Pace. He started in Volio, the app, a year and a half ago. Yep. You guys raised 1.4 pre-seed capital yep. from Craig Weiss, yeah. who is the founder of Enjoy. Yep. Awesome. And you've also worked with... The founders of YouTube, Android, Netflix, FanDuel. Yep. Just flying around in jets with Trump. <laughs> yeah. You just know all these people. And you guys, uh, you plan to raise another $5 million in capital at 100,000 users? Correct, yeah. Wow. And you guys are growing about 5% to 10% a week with mm -hmm. no marketing spend. So organic is growing yep. we'll start like our, crazy. Uh, we'll start our marketing push next week. Oh, you're going to start spending money? Uh, not necessarily spending, but really kind of leverage um, organic content yeah our advisors to reach out to their network got um, it and get bigger names associated with the platform got it got it and your goal is you want to be able to allow anyone with an internet connection around the world to become financially free by putting money in an account and clicking follow correct awesome yeah. well welcome to the podcast brother where do i start i appreciate it where do i start so so walk me through just the beginning early on like how did you get your knack in entrepreneurship? Like, wh what started your knack? Um, I think I was in eighth grade, and I was obsessed with, like, uh, card tricks, sleight of hand, that kind of thing. And I was trying to figure out how to monetize it, how to make money off of it. So I uh, set up some, like, uh, table, put this, like, kind of black sheet behind the table and was videoing um, tricks putting them on this website, and then I would say, okay, here's the trick. You can see how it's done for 20 bucks. You can see how to learn it, how to do it yourself, and then how to do it on other people. Mm. So I did that um, in eighth grade. That was kind of like the first kind of thing I did in tech was like building a website, understanding supply and demand, um, just kind of basic things, how to, how to advertise it. Um, and then freshman year of high school, I got introduced to cryptocurrency. Um, and that's when it kind of really 
got started for me. Um, and I started to spend most of my time focusing on these kind of entrepreneurial investing um, type things. So it was crypto freshman year, all fundamental side. Sophomore year, it was drop shipping. Did that for a year. It, it wasn't really like a passion. You know, like you're naturally passionate about things. I yep. tried it. I wasn't, it wasn't like it's something I was super excited doing. And then junior year, it was the, the technical side of trading, which it just kind of clicked for me, and I really enjoyed that. So spent a year or two trading. Um, was supposed to go to soccer. Was supposed to go to college to play soccer at UCSB, and then um, decided not to a few weeks before camp. Again, that was probably one of the s- strongest gut feelings I ever had was to not go to college. So um, I ended up getting an office in Santa Monica where I pretty much was planning on just living there, studying charts 12 hours a day, and going to figure it out. Um, did did that for about a year, and then um, went into the idea of Involio, and then mm-hmm. raised capital, and then working on that the last year and a half. So when you say you got an office, that was like your apartment at first? You like yeah, lived there? I was going to, yeah. So I, I think I lived there for like two weeks, and then decided, because I didn't think my parents would let me live at home, because I wasn't <laughs> going to go to college. Yeah. So... Was there for two weeks, and they decided, "Hey, you can live at home and figure it out here." So I lived at home for seven, eight months, and then moved out. Mm. Yeah. Okay, got it. Well, really interesting because I think that the journey that you've taken is probably comparable to a lot of folks, mm-hmm. and it's just they're probably listening to this. It could be twenty-year-olds, could be eighteen-year-olds, could be twenty-five-year-olds, and they're like, "My parents think I should do this too, yeah. or, or yeah. what have you," and you totally. decided. You said you had a gut feeling, yep. which is interesting because it's like, how do you quantify that? You totally. just were like, screw it. Was it just because you were reading enough things or talking to enough people that were like, college isn't worth it? Or was it literally like, it, oh. yeah, yeah, I kind of <laughs> was like that. I, it's hard. It's super hard to describe. It's only happened a couple times in my life, but it's like, you almost like can't, not can't breathe. Like you can't think about doing anything else besides it. Like, it was like, I've been playing soccer right. for 18 years. I was supposed to go play at UCSB. And then there's just something in me that's like, you can't do that. Mm. And I, I feel like suppressing that feeling is never good. Like, I think that's allowed me to get to where I am today. So I always, whenever I have that feeling, I listen to it super carefully. Yeah. And I think a lot of people will, like, suppress, like, kind of not listen to it in fear of what other people will think or what their parents will think. So I think it's... Um, if you have that feeling, I would say always trust your gut because it's likely going to take you in the right spot. Right. That's awesome, man. So so starting off with Involio, because that's what I want to talk about in this podcast, and I, and I really want to hone in, like, this is almost like a training call mm-hmm. for VC. Yep. So I don't want to get right into VC, but let's talk about Involio at the start. So so how does Ryan Pace start Involio? Like, wh- how did you come up with everything from the name yeah. to you got a partner, Ian, obviously, yep. like, like how does that kind of develop? Yeah. I'll start it from the beginning. So I was trading and I was trying to absorb as much information as possible from people online, Instagram, Twitter, wherever it is. Right. And the information that's being shared online, it's super hard to understand the value from it because you don't know, like if I'm, let's say I'm listening to you talk about trading I have no idea if you are a super good trader or not. There's no place where I'm like, I'm going to go verify Patrick's track record. And be like, man, this guy's 90% win rate. He's been trading for two years. I'm going to start consuming his content and paying for it. Mm-hmm. Um, so without having something like that, it was super hard for me to learn from people. And I'd end up paying for people's content. And then as I start following them, I find out they're really bad at trading. So the, the fundamental idea of Involio was building a platform where people can grow a following based on their track record and what they do rather than posting in front of the car or the watch or cash. Right. So it started off by kind of honing out the idea. I spent probably f- four to five months just sketching it out, like just going through different mocks. I had a whiteboard where I had all these like pieces of paper, every screen, like home screen, portfolio. And, and how did you come up with stuff. the mocks? Did you have designers or did you just I like did it myself. So it was just me on a piece of paper and I probably Oh, you're just drawing. Yeah, yeah. Probably wow. 30, 40 iterations. Everybody always wants to spend <laughs> money <laughs> and they think it yeah. they need all these softwares. You're drawing yeah. pen and paper. Because at the beginning, it's just a lot of critical thinking time. Like you're mm-hmm. thinking through, okay, here's the portfolio screen. How does yeah. this fit for each side of the note? The hard side, the easy side, which we can go into later. Um, how do they use it? Okay, then now let's go to example. If you're a short-term trader, long-term trader, if you're a crypto trader, if you're a forex trader, 
So there's a lot of critical thinking time that goes into it, and that's what some things VCs will look for, is like how how thought like how much has this founder thought through the idea, and is there any holes that he hasn't poked in it that we can, and that's sometimes a red flag, because they want someone that's like, man, this guy's spent hundreds and hundreds and thousands of hours thinking through this idea, and kind of like there's an example of like Bill Gates where he was he was driving in a car. This guy turns on music, and he's like, turn that music off because it's less time I can think about Microsoft. And wow. it's like kind of like you have to be kind of that obsessed with the idea and how focused you are on e- every single thing because there's hundreds of puzzles to solve. So um, had all those screens, again, 30, 40 different designs. And then finally when I thought, okay, this is kind of a version one that I think we should go to a designer and have build, went to a designer, built, kind of just put it into Figma, which is just a – a platform where people can design apps and then it's easy for devs to see those designs and put it into code. Right. Um, so, yeah, got those designs done and then spent another probably two, three months with the designs. And during that time... Like tweaking the designs. Yeah. And yeah. And then Because you kind of want at least some fleshed out product before you go to dev. Because um, otherwise, development work is more expensive than design work. You can get designs done tweaked easy. If you're like, hey, build this out, that might take two weeks for a designer to do in two days. So you kind of want a solid idea. Otherwise, you're just spending too much money and you're going back and forth and it's kind of a mess. Um, so, yeah, once I had the um, the designs done, I spent a lot of time thinking how like the best way to structure a raise uh, and how to go at it. By raise, you're talking about raising capital. Raising capital. Most people hear yeah. a raise and they think yeah. about getting a raise <laughs> yeah. for a job. Yeah, raising <laughs> capital. And um, you kind of want to do it from – you want to raise from the – highest signal people you can and what i mean by that is let's say you raise your pre-seed from which is what's pre-seed uh it's in stage so your first round of funding is your pre-seed that's the earliest stage earliest stage okay um this is a master class yeah yeah (laughs) so the when you're raising your pre-seed you want to raise it from the highest signal people you can and same thing with every round after that and what i mean by that is if you raise it from let's say your mom and dad when you go to your when you're raising your next round, your seed round is like, hey, who did you raise your last round from? And if it's from your mom and dad, they're like, okay, eh, like that's not really like, oh, I yeah. want to hop in. But if you're like, hey, I just raised our pre seed from a guy that created a billion dollar company, they're like, oh, I'm gonna join. Oh, because they're looking at, they're like following the guy's track record. Exactly, yeah. and and there's some companies like it gets to a point where you can have h- such high signal VCs fund you where other VCs will invest in you just because that fund invested in you. Right, it's like almost following trade signals. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> yeah, so wa- wa- we wanted to structure the company where it can scale, and to do that, again, you have to have high signal investors from every stage, so that way you can continue doing that each stage after that. And to get these top VCs, you kind of have to understand this concept of pattern matching, which a lot of kind of tier one founders will talk about. Um, which is every VC when they're talking, when they're talking to any founder, that VC themselves has probably talked to thousands of founders. And if they're really good at what they do and they are a tier one VC, they've probably made, let's say out of every hundred investments, three to five possibly become billion dollar companies. Mm. So now every time they're talking with the founder, they're trying to find how do I, is this a founder that is going to create a billion dollar company? Because that's the game they're playing. They're lo- they're looking for outsized returns. Yeah. And it, yeah, is is so this going to be? They expect to lose money on ninety five. Yeah. They expect they to lose it all. They Burn expect it. to they expect to lose money on. S- I think it's like 70 percent of their investments. Like, do they expect it to go to zero? Yeah. Like they they just. Yeah, it's it's a game of I'm going to make a hundred bets which and five work out. Which let's I'll let you continue, but let's like state the obvious here. If you got a million bucks from a VC, yeah. he trusted you. Yeah. And you set up everything correctly. And it burns. Yeah. You're not on the hook. You're not personally no. liable. No. No. No, they they invested for the equity. So they, let's say they put in a million dollars and they get X amount of. And they're the like, company. sorry. You're like, sorry. Yep, yeah. It didn't work. Yep. And they'll try to help, but. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't work. Got yep. it. Okay. Okay. So, so continue. Yeah. So you kind of want. So when, again, when talking, VCs are talking to founders, they're like, I've talked, I've met, let's say, 20 of their, com- let's say they invested in 500 companies, 15 became billion dollar companies. They're now looking for founders that are like those 15, the, the founders that ran those 15 companies. And you're saying like, you're saying they act like? It's, it's everything. How like they it's e- behave? It's everything from what they focus on to how they portray themselves to what features, like, I mean, to who they raised money from in the past to their legal team. Like, I mean, it's every single thing they're saying. Mm. 
is this a match or, or not? And, and I'll give this example. It's the same way if you're trading, you've looked at hundreds of thousands, or maybe not hundreds of thousands, but thousands of charts, and now you look at the live chart, the live price. You're like, I've seen this before. I've seen this before. This looks like it's going to go up or down. You're pattern mm -hmm. matching all that, all the charts you've seen to what you see now. Yeah. And again, same thing the VCs do. They've seen it hundreds or if not thousands of founders. They're pattern matching the ones that have succeeded to what you're talking about, what you're saying, how you – it could be how you dress. Like to a certain point, like if you walk in – if you were walking into A16Z and you're meeting with their um, – the GPs there, and the A16Z for the audience, it's the top fund in the world. Like most people like – I was going to say, I have no idea yeah, what you're talking A16Z's about. A16Z is like – A16Z. It's Andreessen Horowitz's <laughs> – they, like, they call it – like you can't name a – Probably it'd be hard to name a company that was worth more than ten billion that they didn't fund, mm. like Airbnb, Uber, Instagram. Like they are the does everything. guys. Yeah. So when they invest in you, it's a big deal. So it, it from like the close thing, like there's probably not many founders they've invested in, if any, that are walking in with an iced out AP and a Gucci bag. Like no. it's just it's just like it's super low signal. Like if you're doing that, they're like. That's just a red flag. There's no pattern. Because you're dumping your money yeah. into bullshit. And it's also like there's no – for them, as pa like they're pattern matching. They they can't name a single founder that created a billion-dollar company that did that. So mm. they're like, okay, that's – they're not going to have any connection to say let's make this investment if they're doing that. Mm. So it's like small things to sometimes what you wear to the way you talk. Like a lot of people in the tech space, they use certain, they'll use like certain lingo. Um and you, you studied all this? Yeah. Like YouTube interviews or like how did you learn a lot this of information? A lot of it's YouTube. Like uh, I spent, again, like probably four or five months and before that too, but there was four or five months where it was like 10 hours a day. And I just watched a lot of these kind of top founders speak uh, from like yeah. Sam Altman, Reid Hoffman, Brian Chesky, Travis Kalanick, founders of Uber, LinkedIn, whatever. And you just kind of realize a lot of them talk somewhat similarly. They focus on similar things. They're focusing on network effects you learn how they focus on those things. Like for, let's just say, um, for Tinder, like um, um, Reed, I'm breaking out, Sean, Ra Sean Rad, Sean Rad, I think that's, yeah, Sean Rad, the guy that started Tinder, um, when he was focusing on Tinder and building out those network effects, it was, um, we're going to go to one college, we're going to throw a party, everyone that has, everyone come to this party at USC, to get into the party, you have to download Tinder, and it started growing like that. Wow. And they understood the hard side and the easy side of the network. The hard side is how do you get people that are super attractive using this app in one area at the right age where when all their friends come on, they see people they know, they see attractive people, and it can grow from there. So it's just like something. I like see. So when I was talking about network effects to uh, our lead, Craig, there was a pattern match from what I was saying to how we're going to grow our platform the same way Sean Rad grew his. Mm. Or the same way eBay grew theirs. So you're saying, it, so so in the case of Involio, you're saying the hard side is like stellar investors traders, yep. and traders that actually want to show their trades. Exactly. And if you get the hard side on the platform, you will get hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people to come follow them. Right. So it's building a platform it's, for it, the hard side. It's kind of a hard, it, it would be a hard platform to build. Yeah. Wouldn't it? Because yeah. you got all these guys that 99% of people online follow that actually yep. don't make money. They make money off of something else. Mm-hmm. Then you've got the small, slim amount that actually make good money that would be willing to, that's your hard side, that would be yep. willing to share. And then you've got the guys that do well that are not willing to share. Correct. And there's a new category coming up with what we're building where there's these guys that have never used social media before. They're not on Twitter. They're not on Instagram. Mm -hmm. But now they're joining Involio. Like we have this kid out of Spain. He's uh, at W the Investor on Involio. I think he's 190 trades as of today and with like a 90 plus win rate. Might be like 95. Wow. And he, again, has no socials, came on because he can start growing a following based on sharing his trades. He doesn't want to post photos. He doesn't want to do this. He just like, I want to share trades, and if I can help other people make money, that'd be cool. They'll follow him. Yeah. yeah. So there's this kind of new subset of kind of creators that are coming on um, that have kind of really liked just being able to post their trades and not have to post kind of all the bullshit that s comes with social media. Right. So as we transition into – you kind of building this out. Mm -hmm. You you get this pre-seed capital, which now I know what that means. Yep. Um, how much you got? One point four, or from this one guy you're talking about, you got a million. Yeah, pre-seed was one point four, and then we've raised a little bit after that, but that's not public yet. God, that's not public knowledge, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Got it. We haven't released that yet. So, how how I, you could just say I can't answer that, but like you've gotten like one point four. Let's say it's yeah one point four. How much have you spent? 
or do you not want to say yet? Um, we've deployed around 800 for the platform. Yeah. And that's going, what, what's the majority of the money go to? If somebody's Develop. building an app, developing the app. Yeah. So it developers. goes to, most of it goes to developers. And, and then how many designing. developers do you have on the job right now? We have four full time. And you just pay them full time. And that's where the bulk of it, or is it, is it, or is the higher cost like that one random firm you hired that does really good work for design or something? No, no, we, you, no, you sh- like I wouldn't go to a necessary firm for design. Um, you could find really good designers um, for probably three, four k a month that oh, are wow. like stellar. Yeah, but just you just kind of have to have the right like you just kind of have to be in the right circles where like a lot of founders are dealing with similar engineers or designers. Like the designer we use is the same designer two or three of my friends use. Mm. Um, so you don't need to spend a ton. Most of it does go to development, um, and. All the money at the beginning sh- really should be going to the product until you have um, what's called product market fit, um, which is product market fit just like people love what you love what you do. It's growing on its own. It has most of the time certain metrics if it's in a certain category. Like most funds will be like, okay, if you're consumer product, you should be growing X amount a month. You should have this user retention after day one, day seven, day yeah. thirty. And if you have that, it's considered product market fit. But some some like Reed Hoffman, the guy that started LinkedIn, he uses example. He's like when you reach product market fit, it'll punch you in the face because it's like, it's that painful. Cause once you hit that, there is a hundred problems to solve every day. You're moving extremely quick. You now have competitors popping up. You have to raise more capital. You have to move fast enough to where you can own the market. Um, mm. So yeah, it's um, you kind of want, yeah, you reach product market fit and then you can move on from there. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So you spent some money, you've, you've, you've raised some money. But let's kind of get back into the raising talk. Mm-hmm. So how do these conversations typically go? You Obviously, you talked about pattern matching. So you, you've done your due diligence there. But for instance, for the Craig? Yeah. Million bucks? Yep. How, how long from the time when you first sp- spoke to him to him writing you a check was that period? And then like name... Kind of explain how that process looked. What did you have to do to make that happen? Like, um, yeah, let me. Yeah, there's I, no revenue. No, right? There's no revenue. This is amazing to me. No revenue, no product. You literally don't have a product. No. And you're just like, it's gonna work. And yeah. he gives you a million dollars. Yeah. Do you understand how insane that sounds to me? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely insane. Yeah. So talk me through this. How did you do this? So, um. I can't take full credit for this explanation. So there's this guy that I'm really close with. His name's Adam Leor. And he describes it almost as a triangle. And once you have this triangle, you can raise capital. And this is what, um, the same way, like, the guys that are raising hundreds of million dollars, they use the same tactic. You kind of have to have all three. So you have to have one. um, People in the tech space call, like, networked people a node. It's like one point that a lot of things can branch off of. Mm -hmm. And so if you have... If you have a node, you kind of want a node in the tech space where they're like, okay, I can intro you to this VC, this marketing guy, this engineer. So you want to get one of those type of people on your team as soon as you can. So you have a node that can say, hey, I'm going to intro you to this VC. And when they intro you to this VC, they o- there's almost like this ex- high level of trust that if this guy's going to recommend you, you're probably doing something cool. Yep. And now there's, this less, there's less time of due diligence. They're not like, hey, I need 20 meetings because – you just cold emailed me and I don't really know anything about you or what you're doing or what your team is like. So the the first part of the triangle is having someone that can make that intro. And then the second thing is um, the the pattern match, which I described. When they talk to you, are you a pattern match with from everything, your legal, the way you talk, what your product is, how it scales, your distribution strategy. Is that a pattern match with um, a company they funded that created a billion dollar company? The third is the chart which is you have to have X percent growth. So and obviously in the early stages, you don't have the chart because no. you just don't have that. So it's just the first two. It's you want a strong intro and you want to be a pattern match to other founders. So for Craig, I got intro to him through a founder he trusts. Um, we, at the time, we just, we just kind of got the designs done. We were putting together a team and we weren't looking to raise capital at that point. You were not looking. At that point, no. So yeah. it was more just, hey, let me talk to you. This is what we're working on. He's like, yeah, well, as you guys grow and put something together, let me know. So we, well, I went on LinkedIn. Friend requested everyone in Arizona with the word developer like, um, in their name. <laughs> <laughs> D- 
Literally, that's <laughs> yeah. how you found developers. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm not joking with you. Every single week, I max my LinkedIn invites. I, I, I mean, it, <laughs> then and I, then yeah. now they're yeah. accepting. Now you got to start writing messages. Yeah. Now I'm writing messages. Like, yeah. So I did that for like two, three, two, maybe two, three months. Got found a team, and then um, and then went to back to Craig. Was like, hey, we've got a team. Here are our designs. Um, we'd love to have you on board. It was probably talk to him. He's like, okay, let me. I think we met at some coffee shop. He's like, okay, let me come in, check check your office out, meet some of your team. He came in, talked to our team. We talked a little bit about distribution strategies. He had four or five other VCs come in and talk to me. And then a week after that, him and his partner came in, and we talked about the ways to structure structure the raise. And then they um, offered to write a check, which we can go into how to structure because there's mm-hmm. different ways to structure a raise. Um, we got that figured out. Two weeks later, um, attorneys go back and forth on minor things like, hey, um, like board seat, um, just kind of basic stuff, like nothing too crazy. You get something agreed upon, um, sign the term sheet, and then the check comes in a couple of days later, or wi- a wire does. Yeah. So what are the different ways? You mentioned structuring. Like yeah. what, what are the different ways that you can structure this? Because some people think um, – I mean, I've talked with you more now, so I understand a little bit more, but like, oh, raising capital, I lose all control mm-hmm. or uh, I'm I'm losing all my equity. I'm basically giving away my company. How do you, what are the different ways to structure yeah. a deal? And then how did you structure this in particular? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's different, um, there's different percentages you should, like that are common to give up each raise. Like the pre-seed, it's like 22, 23. Seeds, like 19, 20. Series A is 15 to like 18 to 19. So there's like a com- percentage like of the company. Yeah. So then I'll, l- let's talk about it. But by the end of raising on all these rounds, how much does the founder usually own? It depends. So like, um, for example, the guys that started Airbnb, one of like their early rounds, they gave up like 40 or 50 percent of the company. Oh, wow. So they ended up with like, I think the founders never like, might have been like eight to ten, five to ten. But a lot but of the and you're saying founders plural, so this is between multiple. People. Yeah, this mean two. I think there were two founders. That so they gave up ninety percent of their company overall. But overall. a lot of the a lot of the time is they'll give founders more equity to keep kind of um, keep them excited about what they're doing. So like mm-hmm. let's say they ended up giving a ton of equity. They built something great. They needed a lot of capital, and now their their like equity percentage is super low. Sometimes the board would be like, okay, let's dilute everyone two, three percent to get the founders more equity um, and get them back get on the investing schedule. Again. Yeah. So that, that can happen, but um, yeah, so but back back to the way to structure it. So you're normally want to let's say the pre seed stage, you're given twenty to twenty four percent away. And there's two different ways or two main ways to structure it. Um, it's a convertible safe or a price round. Um, a price round just means hey we're gonna value the company at let's just say ten million. We're gonna write you a million dollar check. And now we have ten percent of the company. Very and simple. It's just it's just done. Shark Tank type stuff. Shark, yeah. But the paperwork on that's there's a lot more paperwork on it. You're like you now have a security. It's way more like, like it's more capital intensive for attorneys on both sides. So I would I would be saying like probably ninety plus percent of founders in the early stages up to maybe like a Series A, Series B, use what's called a convertible safe. Mm-hmm. Um, which means which means like if. A lot of the time, like you don't like, especially in the early stages, it's hard to put a valuation on a company. Like how, how no do revenue. you? Yeah, how do you? How do they? How do you value us? Um, if we don't even really have a product, so what they'll do is they'll say, okay, we're gonna have every convertible safe has a cap. So let's just say, for us, um, this is just an example. They'll say, hey, we're gonna give you a ten million dollar cap, which means we're gonna invest a million dollars now, and that that equ- or that capital is going to convert into equity at the next round of funding so if or, or whenever a certain let's say dollar amounts raised got it so it's let's say if we're at 10 million and the cap's 10 million and our next round is at a hundred million dollar valuation their million dollars is going to convert at 10 million now and you're you're predetermining these numbers yep yeah and then and sometimes it comes with a discount so it'll be like like an example of how to word it would be like uh i've raised a million dollars on a $10 million convertible safe with a 20% discount. And the 20 per di- 20% discount would mean if they, let's say, they raise at $10 million and they have a 20% discount, their million-dollar investment would go in at $8 million. Got it. So it's just kind of a way of like, hey, if we, we want we want to be rewarded for coming in early. We don't want to pay more than $10 million. 
once this does convert next round, no matter what you're worth, if you're worth 12, 15, 20, we're not paying more than 10. And if you raise next round at 5 million, well, we did, and time went on, we deserve to still have a better entry because we came in early. So we yes. get 20% off 5 million. Got it. So there's a cap, yep. but then there's a discount if it's below. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes they'll have a discount, sometimes they won't. I am mesmerized by this because yeah. there's still no revenue. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But at the same time, it's like none of these major companies would have been where they were without a bunch of money. Yeah. You just simply can't, and that's their business. That's yeah. what they know. Yeah, and that, I mean, that's how a lot of these come. Like, um, it's, yeah, it's like there's a, it's called like pre-seed investors yeah. you know, or angel investors. Yeah. Um, and they'll they'll write the checks anywhere. Normally, it's like two, anywhere from like fifty to like five hundred, mm-hmm. um, sometimes up to a million. And it's just for people that have some, some like they can prove that they ha- can have an idea. They can put a team together. They can have some type of early product done. Like for us, it was just designs, and you could it was like kind of a flow. You can click through it, um, and it's kind of the it's the high risk high reward play where it's like you're in super early, so most of the time you are gonna fail. But if one hits, you're set. So, like, most, yeah. most funds, they're determined by one or two investments. Like, they might make 100 investments, and the reason their fund was successful was because one or two companies. It's crazy. Yeah. It, it's because the reward is just so big. Yeah. So, they're like, we're going to go invest $50 million. Yep. And 500 and 100 companies yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And two of them are going to hit, and we're going to 20x yeah, yeah, wh- like whatever there's that. there's one guy's name's chris saka uh i think he was on shark tank for a little bit but he has like a crazy like first fund story he was his first fund i think it was like might have been five million or lower um and he goes i'm gonna um he raised some money from friends i'm gonna have this is me fund one and in his fund one there was three companies i know that i, f- I forgot the third was but it was twitter he was a, one of the first investors in twitter and then this, and then he was at a party, and he was like, he saw this guy just sit like that he hadn't seen in a while, um, on his computer, and he's like, "Hey, what are you working on?" Eh, it's this app for like photo sharing. Yeah. He's like, hey, "Let's talk again next week." We talk again next week. He's like, I, "It seems really cool. Let me fund it." First check in, that was Instagram. So it's just kind of like these. You kind of just have these. You kind of want to be. In, that's why it's Silicon Valley. At least five years ago, it was super prominent because you have this kind of like super condensed area of founders and VCs. So where you can kind of have these opportunities pop up mm-hmm. more, but re- uh, like really it's just the VCs looking to find one to five companies that can have some crazy outside yeah. return that makes their fund successful. Yeah. I think I forgot to mention, um, for those of you that are listening in Volio is available right now. You yeah. can Android and Apple. Yep. You can go search it in Volio, um, with an I. Yep. And you guys can check it out for free. Yeah. It's, it'll, it'll, Always be free. Um, free to download, and then at, at some point, I imagine your monetary sort of game plan is to have whoever's creating the content or yep. the trades. You're there. You're going to pay to follow them. Yeah, you can. They can monetize your trades, and there's um yeah, there's a ton of really good traders. Like I think our we have like a leaderboard on the app with um showing like the win rate percentage. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I think and how is that verified right now? How does that work? So, if I'm let's just say taking a Bitcoin trade. Yep. Um. I go on the app. We have the live prices to the millisecond for all these different asset classes, crypto, stocks, Forex, commodities. I go on. I'm going to add Bitcoin to my portfolio. I say, I'm going to enter here. I'm going to add my price target. I'm going to add my hold time, making this kind of information more actionable. If I'm just sharing, I bought Bitcoin. Am I holding it for a day, a year? Am I going for 1%? Am I going for 200%? The information's not actionable. So you go and share Bitcoin. Let's say my price target's 30K. I think it'll be there in the next two weeks. Then I click share. And the moment you click share, it grabs the live price. Mm-hmm. And then you have a live P&L until you close. And you can't delete trades. So you have this verified track record of every time I share a trade, I can see the P&L until I close. And then someone can click their close track record and see how often they've been right. And eventually, we'll have um, APIs where you can connect your Robinhood or whatever platform you use to trade. And it can just directly connect. So the golden question, you don't have to share their names. Has anybody gone on the platform and absolutely just like <laughs> yeah. shit the bed yeah. and then now they're off? <laughs> yeah. 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 There's been some big names that have come on <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I've been the ones posting the Lambos posting. I'm making a million a month trading. Pay and for they my couldn't, course. They, they couldn't they send a winning trade to make their life depend no, on it. No. If they had a gun to their head, they might not have been able to. 
Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. So I, I got some questions down here that I'm interested in. I, I want to know, since you got this funding, mm-hmm. it's a two-part question. What We'll start with the this side. What have been what you perceive as the biggest milestone successes since you received your first pre-seed round in Involio so far? There's been some small ones of um, which we can go into. I like just some cool names that we've got to work with, some things I've learned on just networking. But the biggest success was definitely reaching early. Like we have a kind of an early product market fit right now. Mm-hmm. The hardest thing for any company is building something people love. Like if you c- like, th- uh, there's some people like, oh, if I could raise a billion dollars, I could build a great product and compete with Instagram or Twitter. That's insane. It, 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 like having a billion dollar, like Google will fail projects all the time with hundreds of billions of dollars. They tried to create a product that would would compete with Facebook. They got a hundred million users. They still failed because. They just didn't build something users love. There's no amount of money that c- like that you can have that would allow that to happen. So the hardest thing for any company is you build something users love, not just kind of like you'd rather you'd rather have a product. Let's say if a hundred people came on, you'd rather have a people a product that let's say five to ten people loved than like fifty to sixty people kind of liked because people only use products they love. There's already so many products. You need something that people love. So our biggest accomplishment so far would definitely be reaching. I would call it like an early product market fit. Um, where we've had de- a decent amount of people join, and there's people that will just absolutely love it. They'll spend four to five hours a day on it. They're posting 20 times. They're sharing trades. They'll talk about those on social media once a week. So it's definitely finding that and then obviously building on top of it. Yeah, that's super cool. Yeah. So to flip that on you then, what ha- since you received funding, what's been your re- biggest challenge so far? Roadblock, barrier. He doesn't have challenges. <laughs> no. <It's laughs> the, the biggest one was, I mean, it's probably the same answer. It probably was finding product market fit. And you have this pressure to move fast. Like, so in, in v, the reason why VC-funded companies have this kind of almost gold check to them is because, especially as you scale, is because VCs only fund companies that can at least grow 100% a year. Mm. Um, so you have to be, a, you have to move really quick. So there's there's this kind of pressure you have to move quick because VCs are looking for some type of exit or growth every month over month. Um, but yeah, definitely the hardest part was finding product market fit because you're iterating for months and months and months trying to be like, okay, let's test this feature. Okay, we, we shipped it. Users found it confusing and didn't like it. And and, and, and that is, I don't know this because I don't have an app. How, how is that determined? Is there actually it, metrics yeah, on the back end? Yeah, yeah. You'll look at um, you look at daily active users, weekly active, monthly active. You'll look at what happens. You can see how long they've been on it. Yep, how, how many times? How often people that come uh, uh, that come on the app? How long do they? How many stay until day two? How many stay until day seven? How many stay till day thirty? And then how do you kind of increase each one of those metrics? Mm-hmm. Um, and that w- that's what one of the biggest reasons um, in the early stages I brought on um, Ian was because he was the hard side of the network. I, I remember following him for like a couple of years and yeah. he had this large, he had like 4,000 people paying monthly for his Discord. Um, he was one of the only guys in the crypto space that wasn't doing scams. Like everyone had that opportunity to say, hey, let me let me um, do an NFT project and flip it. Their picture. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He had a ton of those opportunities and he denied every single one of them. Probably could have made five, 10 million from it, but cared more about like, hey, I'm, I'm going to do the right thing. So when I saw that and I was like, okay, he's someone that's like anti-scamming, which w- pretty much is the foundation of Involio. Mm-hmm. And he knew exactly kind of probably the features to build to get someone like himself to love it. And, w- and he's been kind of sharing trades for that long. And he knew exactly how to share them to where users could understand. Mm. So he was instrumental for that, for f- helping find product market fit. Um, but th- th- those are honestly probably the biggest success and the hardest challenge. Well, the overall sort of thought process that you have around this is amazing because you've thought through it and then you have like the, the metrics. You can see how long they've been on, which I imagine is kind of crazy, the drop off from like day one to day seven still, right? Is it, 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 the, at first, yeah. So It's getting better, it's obviously. Getting, it, that's the kind of the biggest thing. Like you kind of, um, to anyone building a, an app or any product that's trying to focus on building a network, um, or honestly, any 
Pretty much any product, actually. It's hard. You, there's one thing you should focus. Like every, every company kind of has a north north star they focus on. So like for Facebook, it was um, ten friends in seven days. If you can, if you if you get a user to friend to get ten friends in seven days, I think there's like a there's a ninety percent chance you use the platform every day. Mm. So you kind of want to find that as soon as you can. Like what's going to be our thing a user does where they're going to stay on the platform. And, and you kind of just build around that. Yeah. So, so your goal is getting them to follow a trade. In the yeah. First so it's like hours. for ours, like we're, we're changing the onboarding, which will be out um, by the time this <laughs> pods out where it's going to be, you join the app, you understand the level of talent on the app from the leaderboard. You see their win rate. So it's a join. I see there's 10 traders with a 90% plus win rate. I see their trade. They share trades weekly. You click on it, it explains what an open trade is. Like That means they're in the trade now. It shows the closed trade, says, hey, you can't delete any of these trades. And then it says, um, explains what a verified trade is and says you can click follow. Mm -hmm. And then now they understand, okay, there's really good traders. I can make money on this app. And then when they when you go to their profile page, it prompts you to share your first trade. You share your trade, and then a, kind of a P&L photo pops up, like a, something you can share to Instagram. And that's something we had our designers spend a lot of time on. And in my opinion, I think we have the kind of most unique PL photo um, out of all these different brokerages. So now they have a PL photo they can share to Instagram. Yeah. So the flow is they understand the value of the app, they share their first trade, and then they share it with their friends yeah. and family. So to round this segment out, I'm now interested in hearing you, I can't remember what the number was. I wrote it down. You plan to raise another $5 million mm -hmm. once you hit 100,000 users. Yeah. So, what's the road between now and then? Obviously, we've talked about it, but, mm -hmm. like, how do you look at that as a developer or a founder, excuse me, in trying to guide your company to 100,000 users, especially right now where I'm just thinking as you're talking, the threads thing was a, a really interesting thing to watch. Everybody was on threads for, like, four days, mm -hmm. and now I keep forgetting to open it. Yeah, it's... It's like it's dead. Yeah. It's dying yeah. or dead. And that's where I'm like, when you're talking about this, I'm like, you're literally trying to get someone to commit to opening a new app. Like I open Instagram mm -hmm. every day, Facebook yeah. every day. How can I open in Volio every day? How mm -hmm. do I determine that? So that's obviously a big part of this answer, I would guess, is yeah. how are you going to 100,000 users? And then when you get 5 million, that's the second part of it, but when you get 5 million bucks, what do you use? How do you deploy that capital now that you have something with 100,000 users? I'll do the 5 million thing first. So... Uh, there, uh, Reed Hoffman um, came out with this book. It's called Blitzscaling. And it's a book on what happens, like ho how a founder should move, and how a company should move after they reach product market fit, after users love it, it's growing quickly, people are sharing it on its own. And there's reasons, like the, the, the reason, w I'll explain what Blitzscaling is, but the reason you do that and the reason why you raise the 5, 10 million is because, and the reason you can raise that capital is because you've proved there's a market, you've proved that users love it, mm. and they can see the TAM, the total addressable market, is large. So it's like, let's say for us, we hit 100,000 daily, weekly active users. A VC can see the total addressable markets, let's just say 10, 20, 30 million users. And if we own that market, this company can be worth one, two, three, four, ten billion dollars, depending based on the revenue projections yeah. of whatever, right? So you want. You want to you want to raise enough money where you can get there to that point where you own the market fast enough before people copy you. So there's this example of the I think it's called the Samwer brothers. Um, I forgot what country they're based out of, but this is what they'll do: they'll they'll see a company succeed in the U.S. that has a large TAM. They haven't captured that TAM, and they'll go to the exact same thing in another country. So they did this for Uber. They try to do this for Airbnb. Um, I'll tell the Airbnb story after this, but. The Uber story is like, they're like, okay, we see Uber working in the U.S. Let's launch this. Let's launch this. Uh, I forgot what country they launched in. Let's launch this in a different country, and then Uber has to buy them out. Because now they already own that market. It's going to be super hard for Uber to go there. And, like, what Brian Chesky was um, talking to one of his VCs, and he's like, yeah, we're growing really quick. You start loving our product. Like, what should be our, like, what should be our biggest concern right now? And one of the VCs was like, you should be scared of the Samuel Brothers. Because if they try to copy you, they can move faster. Like, and then they actually ended up did trying to copy him. They raised like $100 million within three weeks. They had 
five times the amount of employees Airbnb had in three weeks, wow. and they tried to copy it. And I don't know why, but for some reason, for them, it didn't work. But it, you kind of have to have this where, again, once you have the product market fit, you have the TAM, you need to raise the money to where you can move fast enough where you own that market. Yeah. So that's w- the money the five million would be used for is probably to increase features. So instead of it taking two weeks to launch this feature, it takes two days. So now you can rapidly iterate quicker, and you can use some of that money for marketing, brand awareness, etc. Yeah, because right now you guys are kind of organic. Yeah. In terms, of you're just finding the biggest creators and yeah. getting them on the platform. Yeah. And are you paying them to do that? No. Like right now, we haven't paid any creators. So we haven't given any like equity packages yet um but we're starting to we're starting to like okay we're like because the, the, there's no reason to bring on big creators unless you have their attention like we because yeah, they want to go all in on one platform well, well also no but what i mean is like if we got mark cuban on the platform and he brings us a million users in a hundred thousand or ten thousand stick there's no reason to pay him anything if you don't have their attention like that's yeah. what so many founders fail they'll be like oh my gosh we just raised 20 million here's our product, let's go spend $10 million on marketing. They spend those $10 million and they end up having no daily active users after six months. Like, th- there's just no reason to do that. You have to have a product with the retention, with the metrics. Once you have that, then go spend the marketing and do that. So we're getting to that point where we are starting to see the daily active, weekly active, monthly active users stick. Um, and now we're starting to go talk to these bigger names saying, hey, let's talk to you about coming on. Yeah. Here's a small equity package. Come on as an advisor, bring your audience over. And then you just kind of keep adding on to that. Which is interesting because you're saying like Mark Cuban. So so that's something that I didn't address earlier is, is you're, you're thinking more than just Forex or crypto or stocks. Yeah. You're, you're thinking cars, houses, watches, yeah. businesses. Yep. So you're thinking the VCs themselves could share the – Yeah. Like that's kind of cool. So yeah. Because th- they're already doing it. They're just not doing it on a public forum. Yeah. Th- the goal is to own the trading space like – um. Every really good founder will be like, okay, focus on a niche and then grow it from there. Like, they're not like, I'm going to go compete with every asset class at the beginning. It's no, focus on a specific niche, get people to love it, and then add on top of it. Mm-hmm. You don't want 100 features when you launch because users find it confusing. So build something simple, get and them right to love it. And right now it's what, stocks, currency, and crypto? Yeah, it's crypto, stocks, Forex, and commodities. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we'll be adding stuff like NFTs, venture capital, real estate, Pokemon cards, shoes, plane, shoes. planes, whatever, like whatever you want. Or And then eventually, so then once you have all the investments, then it'll be my companies. And you can have a portfolio of here's the companies I've started and then here's the ones I've closed. So these are the ones I'm working on. I'm working on this, this, and this. And then these are the companies that I've sold or exited. Do you think the high-level guys are going to have a hard time doing it because they want to remain private with their financial lives? Possibly. Um, like you, you have LinkedIn already for the companies you've a part of, you've grown. Um, right. But I mean, this is more intimate. This is like the money. This yeah. Is pocket but watching. it's not necessarily the dollar amount, though. Like, it's not like some mm-hmm. guy's coming on here and that wants to be super private saying, I've, I'm making, I'm putting 100 million here, 10 million here. That's the cool part about Involio. It's all percentages. So you can say, hey, I'm, I'm in Bitcoin, I'm in real estate. I just, I'm flipping oh, this you, plane. Oh, they're sharing your asset allocation, yeah. like a pie. Yeah, so I've it's not cash, like, exactly. real estate, I'm yeah. in 20% cash, 80% real estate, or whatever it is. So that's the cool part where you've had these big names come on. Like we had the um, founder of FanDuel come on, created a $20 billion company. And he can come on. It's not like he's saying, hey, guys, here's like how much money I'm making. Here's, I'm putting 100000 here, a million here. He's just like, yeah, I'm allocating this for mm-hmm. real estate. This for other startups, this for crypto, whatever. So do you plan to have it um, like spiderweb out? So now now I've got this great following. Mm-hmm. Now it's almost like a marketplace of my products. I have a profile and it's mm-hmm. like, here's my one-on-one, here's my course. Like, do you plan to do that or do you plan to keep it, again, just niche down to only trades and only like what I'm buying? A lot of that's hard to – like you can ha- – we all – like a lot of the – everyone in our company has like predictions on – what we think the users are going to want. Like mm. how we think they're going to want to be able to buy courses. We think they're going to want yeah. to pay for th- trades. At the end of the day, you don't really know until you get there. Like we could have 100,000 u- users join next week and none of them care about videos. None of them care about monetizing portfolios. They just want the, they just want the social side of it. Right. And we don't even add any of that and we focus on the user base. So it's hard to predict what we're going to do. Um, but we do have ideas and we have designs ready for when the user base does want to go in a certain direction. 
we're, we're wow. ready to get, move quick. Yeah. It's so interesting the way you answer that because I think a lot of people kind of, they put themselves in a box and they say, no, here's our product, here's our roadmap. And you immediately answered, well, I don't know, we'll see what the users want. It's like, then you say, oh, I've already got the backup yeah. design ready. Yep. But I'm, I'm going to see what the users want. And yeah. you're kind of letting that be a very organic process, which is, I think, unique in itself. There's a lot of wisdom in that. You're 21. Yeah. <laughs> like, how the hell do you learn all this? Yeah, and, and one thing I want to touch on product, too, is there's, like, we kind of have a mix between both. Like, there's two different ways to look at how you implement your next features and what features to add. So the way Snap Evan Spiegel does it at Snapchat is he believes that it's, it's like users don't know what they want, and it's about us putting the right team together and critically thinking, okay, what feature do we want next? Mm -hmm. Because our users aren't going to know. And, and he does have a point there where, like, when Facebook first launched, like, tagging users and stuff like that, they asked their users, should we do, or, like, or even going to other colleges. Hey, we're at Stanford now. Should we go to this college? Their users said no. We want it just to be this tight network. When they said, do we want to allow tagging users, their user base said, no, I don't want someone to be able to just tag me and it on my, it on my profile page without me knowing. So some, and then once they launched it, everyone loved it. Once, once, use, once they went to other colleges, they spent more time on the app because there was more people in the network. Mm. So sometimes users don't necessarily know what they want. So that's more of like, like Facebook strategy is like, hey, let's listen to our users. What do we want? And go that way. And Snapchat's is we're critically thinking about what feature to add next because our user base doesn't know. And we're gonna and, and they, they yeah. launch features where it's like kind of hidden but there. Where it's not like intrusive. It's not like, oh, this feature's in my face and I hate it and now I'm not using the app. They kind of keep it like hidden where it's like, oh, if I like it, I'm gonna continue to use it. But if not, it's not in the way. So we kind of like the way like um, we kind of think about next features at Involio is kind of a mix between those. Where it's like, yeah, we critically think about the features and sometimes we'll add features that we think our user base will love that maybe they don't know that. And there's also the mix of like, let's listen to what they say and just mm -hmm. add that in there. So it's, we try to have a try to have a mix of both. Awesome. So let's pull out of this for a minute. You're 21. You're building this. You're obviously very driven. What pieces of advice do you give anybody at any age, but really people in your age demographic? Like, what pieces of advice do you give them? Uh, they don't have to be VC funded, VC yeah. founder, but like, what what do you give them? Because they're probably trying to create something if they're listening to this, and if yeah. they're if they've made it, you know, 50-ish minutes in this podcast, they're more serious than most people. Yep. What, what do you tell them? Because they're probably trying to figure something out. Um, this is, I mean, I can give more broad, like, like the broad advice to that answer is, uh, well, we can go a little deeper, but like for, if you want to build something, whether it's like an agency or a product or an app, you kind of have to have it be something you absolutely love and you will do anything to have it succeed. Like, th there's a, Steve Jobs is like, yeah, like, the number one thing between people that aren't successful and are is persistence. Because you have to eat an insane amount of pain to get there, and if you're not like, I will die because I'm so confident, like, I love the product, I love what we're building, I will do whatever it takes to make this kind of, make this go where it needs to go, mm. you're not going to get there. Like, for, for me, like, there was a point where <laughs> it was like a one-month period where we ha we ha I had this ad, um, close friend come in and help, and he, we lived together for like a month. And at the start of the company, it was like more of like a it was corporatized. We had too many employees. We it was just more run like a corporate company, and we needed to switch it to a startup. And we came in. And it was like a month of like twenty hour days trying to solve all these hard problems. It's never fun to fire people. And I almost when the doctor said, if you keep your stress levels this high, you'll go into liver failure. And I was like a walking zombie by the end of that month. So it's like, and most people are like, oh, you should just let it go. It's that you, you guys don't have any product market fit. The idea is not like people tell me the idea is not good. This isn't good. And this is prior to funding or no? This is just after funding. This was like oh, six, five, so six months after funding. That's probably worse because yeah. you got money. Yeah, exactly. So it's like you're in this super painful spot where it's like people are telling you it's going to fail. You the, the, the way it was run before wasn't great. All these problems. So you have to be able to like, I will, I'm literally going to do anything I have to to make this succeed. Like, if I get shot, I'm going to keep moving. Mm. So my advice would be work on something you love that you really believe in. That way, when, like, kind of shit hits the fan, which it 100% will, you're will you, you, you'll be able to get out of that situation and keep moving. Yeah. Yeah. I think that has so much value because modern day, I, I, I feel that 
most people generally younger, mm-hmm. they don't go all in on anything. Yeah. They kind of, I see guys, and this is no disrespect, yeah. but I see guys that'll, they're, I, I, it's hard to describe <laughs> it because then it's just like somebody's going to listen and be like, I know who you're talking yeah. about. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, even here in Scottsdale, yeah. I see the guy that was the wholesaling guru suddenly He's only talking about ATM machines. Yep. Then he's only talking about social media marketing. Yep. Then he's only talking about trading. Now he's only talking about Bitcoin. Yep. And it's like that was all in the span of a three years. Yeah. And it's like. Uh, yeah. It goes back to the same thing. It got hard. Ah, let me go to something else. Ah, yeah. This is difficult. Ah, let me try something else. And if you keep, I mean, yeah, you keep doing that. So it's ha- not gonna work. how do you look at, I'm not able to talk about what I'm building right now. Yeah. But I'm building um, something that's not trading related. Mm -hmm. It's a service. Mm -hmm. And today I was sitting there like reviewing what we have so far. And I was kind of like, holy shit. Mm -hmm. Like this is sick. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it? And and the reason I say that is like, we've gone all in on making sure that once this launches the product itself or the service in this case is so top notch that the moment somebody scans their credit card, they're like, it's worth, and they've only seen, you know, less than a percent of what they've purchased, like a, a tenth of a percent. And they're like, this is worth it. Why do you think so many people focus opposite? I see so many people, they don't really focus on the quality of the product. They're always about, how can I get the next customer? How can I do this? Uh, yeah. Like, uh, why, uh, like why don't they focus on the product? That's really, the only reason that it succeeds. I really like that question. There's, I think there's two, two parts to that. So there's one that goes into the perfection of it. And um, this goes back. I have all these quotes from Reed Hoffman because I really like him. But the guy that started LinkedIn, Reed Hoffman, he goes, um, it was something like Hans, like perfection kills products. So for at least for like, again, I'm pattern matching the 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 understanding I've had on building apps. So it's, it could be different for different products. But for the most part, you kind of want to launch as soon as you can and then iterate from there. Because you could be like, oh man, this product's perfect. We've spent so much time. Let's keep iterating on it. Wait to launch because it's not ready yet. Because as the founder, you're always like, dude, the, if I just add this, it's even better. If I just add this, it's even better. Oh, if I add this, it's 10% better. And you're just going to keep doing that until you launch and then realize, oh, users actually didn't really care about that or they didn't care about this. Mm-hmm. So one part of your question, which I think is like launch as soon as you can. Doesn't You don't have to use like all your social leverage right away. It can be, hey, let's test this out with 20 people, 100 people. But get the product in users' hands as soon as you can because that's when you're really going to start understanding what they want. And then the second part is like, why don't people spend as much time on product? That I that I just don't know. I like. But you know it happens. It happens all the time. Even in yeah. as simple as like agencies, they yeah. just they're not ready. Yeah, I think some. So I can see some people. It's about the, like a quick buck. Like, hey, mm-hmm. let's launch this. Let's make the money and get out. Mm-hmm. And then I can see, okay, like we're not gonna if they don't believe in the product long term why put as much in the product? Like if it's just some guru saying, hey, I have 100,000 followers on Instagram, let me launch a course and get my money. He might not spend a ton of time on that course and yeah. then launch it, get the money and move. Yeah, I've, I've studied a lot of that lately too because I'm like, what what's, there's very few people building courses mm-hmm. that have that are actually like, like you're spending $1,000 and it's like nine Zoom recordings <laughs> of 30, 30 minutes long it's and horrible. there's there's no production. Yeah. yeah. There's no guidance. There's Nothing. no structure. Yep. Uh, I mean, that's, I think, part of the reason why I'm always so excited about this day and age is that that's who we're competing against now. Yeah. You know? Um, so, I guess last, as we wrap up here, I'm just kind of curious on what's your rest of 2023 look like and, and how, like, what are your milestones? What are you trying to accomplish here in the rest of this year with the app, mm-hmm. with your user base and, yeah. and growing there? Yeah, I think um, in the next 12 months, we'll probably close or past a million users um what are you guys at right now we're just under 10k wow um so i think we'll ha- i think we'll have product like a strong product market fit in the next one to three months mm-hmm. where it gets to the point where let's say one out of every 10 uh, out of if 10 users join eight use it monthly seven use it weekly three to four use it daily and and have 
50 to 60 percent of the user base share some post or trade to social media got it and if that, that it's kind of it's it's kind of a numbers game at that point so it's like if you have that many people doing that you have that many people sharing it's going to grow on its own and you'll be at a million then five then ten then twenty um million users and i have a, I have a friend um he's 16 years old his name's jay he has a platform it took him i think 10 months to get to ten thousand users three months to get to a hundred thousand then two months to get to a million and he has 10 million monthly active users right now wow. so you kind of have this exponential curve where again if you build something people love and they're sharing it it's just a matter of time before that hockey stick effect starts to happen so our yep. goal this year is a million users uh, hit those metrics and have that hockey stick ha- ho- ho- hockey stick effect happen something just popped in my head i was going to wrap it up yeah do you think you guys are going to make more money revenue wise from um taking some sort of cut from the creators charging or advertising like being like a free platform like facebook but then making money on revenue on advertising and stuff I think at first it will be. I think at first it'll be um, taking a cut because yeah. you have to have an insane amount of daily active, month, weekly active users to make good money advertising, and you have to have a well-oiled like kind of machine that's doing those ads. Like people think, oh, if I have a million users, we can run ads. It's like no, you have to create a now another marketplace to run those ads, and Facebook's really good at it. I think um, if you're a daily active user on Facebook, uh, not uh, Instagram and you're using it every single day, multiple times a day, their value, your value to face to Instagram is 15 bucks a month. That's how much they make from you from your ads because of how well-oiled their... I mean, uh, they've, they've had to create... I mean, they have to create an entirely new product yeah. because of the creator center to create ads. Exactly. That's like an entirely different development. Yeah, so it, it'll depend too. So I think like, to some of your answer, it's at first it'll be taking a cut, and then if we can reach the scale of where like you're curious what vc investments drake's in and you're curious what stocks he's in you could go on there like and see what it's up to mm-hmm. or like you're curious what companies mark cuban's investing in and you can go on there and see like if once we reach that scale then i think a decent amount of the money that we make will be from ads probably more than half yeah um but before that i think it's going to be monet from the monetization super cool man yeah i think we'll leave it there thanks for coming on first yeah. of all this yeah. is exciting guys if if um if you could, well, Ryan's like a, like a ghost on social media. <laughs> you know, you yeah. can't find it, but, but is this your first podcast? This, I did one, me and Ian did one with Sean Kelly, it was like 20 minutes, but this is like the first podcast where I sat down with someone and Got it. talked to him. Yeah, I would consider this my first one. Got it. Guys, if you can, in the comments section, let us know what your biggest takeaway was. If you made it this far, of course, if you didn't, screw you. <laughs> uh, if you made it this far, though, l- let us know, because it's, it's an interesting topic. I've built a lot of different things and it's always bootstrapped with uh, my own money and it's not through this and listening to him talk about this sort of stuff in one way excites me another way pisses me off because it's like what could I have developed so guys if you got some value out of that first of all go down I, I'll have all of Brian's stuff in the description as well as the uh, Involio link to download we'll make sure Jason gets that right Jason he'll get that done and um, as always guys click that like button um and if you could click the subscribe button we're a little over twenty thousand subscribers now so thank you guys so much and we'll see you in the next video Boom. Nice. good shit <laughs>